Hawks, and welcome to our regular Board of Education meeting. Tonight is November 6th, and we will start the evening with administrative reports. Good evening, and, and welcome. First item is to congratulate the Board on receiving the CABE Level 2 Leadership Award once again this year, and the award will be presented at the CABE CAPS Convention on November 15th. There was professional development held in the district yesterday, focused on district improvement needs, both in and out of PLC. Today, there was a district-wide wellness day for students and with celebrations held at all the schools. Uh, Superintendent-elect Dr. Jordan Grossman is present this evening at the board meeting. Welcome. Though he does not begin until January 1st, Dr. Grossman has been in the district already a few times. He was in on Monday to meet with central service administrators uh, concerning next year's budget. He attended part of yesterday's PD activities and greeted teachers and attended the curriculum subcommittee earlier tonight. Veterans Day celebrations are being held in all of the schools beginning today and going through Monday. I myself attended the high school celebration today in which I was at, I shared a story about the fact that my uncle uh, was killed at Iwo Jima and it was his division that was present when the flag was raised at Mount Suribachi. So it was very personal for me that I was able to do that. Obviously, he, was, he died before I was born, um, and uh, it, was, uh, you know, it was something I wanted to share uh, with, the, with the veterans there that, uh, you know, that was my personal tie-in, um, but, but also the fact that how much you know, that I personally appreciate, appreciated their service. Um, other uh, Veterans Day celebrations will be held Kelly Lane Friday at 9, Wells Monday at 9, and the middle school at 115 on Monday. Uh, last Friday, uh, Kelly Lane students missed school due to uh, our second power outage. That day will need to be made up before the end of the school year, and I, Dr. Grossman and I will be discussing some, some thoughts about that. We are just hired a new media specialist for the middle school, Leanne Ryan, who will be coming to us from the Heartland Public Schools. She'll begin on the 18th of November, and uh, we are also currently interviewing for an elementary physical education teacher. Uh, budget meetings continue this week internally with high school athletics and Kelly Lane. The high school vest view project is going well. The middle school roof project is almost complete. Thankfully, trim work has begun. Sixth grade students are going to Boston Science Museum tomorrow, rescheduled from the first power outage day. And uh, fifth graders are headed to Old Sturbridge Village on Friday. Uh, the PTA Jogathon was held on the 19th of October. This is the PTO's major fundraising event, and to date they have raised over $15,000. Uh, congratulations to Caroline Hall, who's an eighth grade student at the middle school, and Lizzie Capelli, senior, who will be recognized on Friday um, at the Farmington Valley Superintendents Association Awards winners. And I'll be attending that along with both uh, Mrs. Henneberry and Mr. Dunn. Uh, the next regularly scheduled board meeting is on November 20th. There will be early release on November 27th, no, and no school on the 28th and 29th. And lastly, by the authority invested in me, there will be no more power outages <laughs> and inclement weather between now and December 20th. All right, well, uh, any, for that. <laughs> um, any questions for Mark Windsor? I didn't know we had an, op an elementary PE opening. All yes. right. I probably was told, but I've already forgotten that. Um, so moving on to board member announcements, um, I have an announcement, uh, more of a just a comment uh, and a thank you. Granby held our municipal elections, as we all know, yesterday, and the citizens voted for change to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education. I want to congratulate Rosemary, Jenny, and Mark on the re-election and welcome Dave Pelling to the Board of Education as a new member. I also want to take a moment and say farewell to my friend and fellow board member, Lynn Gelzow. Lynn has covered the board for 10 years as a reporter for the Granby Drummer, 
and served two full terms on our board. Lynn was a part of many positive changes during these eight years, including a few of the highlights, full day kindergarten, integrated preschool, closing the current school, serving under three different board chairs, searching for new administrators, and lastly, our superintendent search. She rarely missed a meeting and was a founding member of our Granby Equity Task Force. I like to say that Lynn asked the tough questions that made this board and our schools better. Lynn, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. Any other comments from the board? I just usually it comes up the uh, uh, since it's Veterans Day um, and uh, all of our celebrations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Rosemary's service because um, that always makes me feel good that we actually have a board member who's a veteran. So thank you, Rosemary. Thanks. Rosemary, will you be in the schools on Monday? I, uh, Monday for the middle school. And will yes. you be in your uniform? I will, if it fits. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the question, right? Um, I, I'll make a comment about Veterans Day. Um, I love that we have school on Veterans Day because without having school and having those honoring ceremonies, to me, it would just be another long weekend for the kids. And I think that's really important um, to, to have school on Veterans Day. So if someone feels otherwise, I do not agree with you. <laughs> I don't feel otherwise, but I attended the high school PAC meeting. You want me to report on it now or wait till later? Um, do we have an article for PAC? We have Crack and Cave calendar of events. Uh, feel free to report on it now. Um, so I went to the PAC meeting, I guess it was Monday night at, at the high school. Um, uh, core group of parents and uh, Mr. Dunn were actually explaining the cell phone policy. Um, uh, they're going to do some surveying of the students and the parents at the high school, um, reminding them of what the policy is and um, kind of looking to see if we need to make any tweaks or adjustments to it. So. All right, that's important. Yep. yep. Student representative reports. Uh, should we, we, this is the night that Toritha can be late. Um, let's just scooch down to, do you mind, Jack? I'm sorry. No, that's fine. And we should have a final on the field hockey score by then. Um, let's move student representative reports, reports to below teaching and learning. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind presenting on teaching and learning, instructional rounds. Good evening, everyone. I think this is my last consecutive meeting to present to you for, <laughs> for a couple meetings, so I think I had three in a row. So this is it. Um, last spring, um, one of the teaching and learning items was on opportunities for teacher leadership, and one of those pieces that we featured was, we call them learning walks. Um, they've been renamed to instructional rounds, so I wanted to take a deeper dive into to that specific piece for you. Um, the instructional rounds language is not a renaming for the sake of anything, but that's actually what they are called uh, in the research base of education. Um, Richard Elmore, who was at Harvard at the time, really developed um, this plan, and he's been a, a big figure in Connecticut as well, and has worked with the Connecticut Superintendents Network, really brought it to our state, and it's a practice we've used for several years. Um, the basic idea uh, is we look at a problem of practice that a principal identifies, uh, and the administration and teachers and other leaders around the district, I call it descending on a school for a day because that's what we do. We have 16 to 24 people are working with the school and supporting a principal um, in a specific, uh, it's called a problem of practice, but it really means an instructional challenge that they feel the school's facing and everyone's going to look and help and dig into this problem and make some recommendations for improvement. The framework we use is called the instructional core. And the basic idea is we look at what is happening related to that problem in regards to what the student's doing, what the teacher's doing, and what the nature of the content is and how that centers around the task. So in those boxes that break out, we just have some questions that we might ask in regards to those different groups. And this will make a little bit more sense when I give you an example in a second. Uh, so the process is the principal starting at the red at the top, the principal identifies that problem and then we go out into classrooms and we're really looking for specific observable evidence related to that problem. We come back, we do this information dump, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, 
we try to put that into some type of framework and then we make short and long-term recommendations to support the principal and then a group comes back at the end of the year to see if progress was actually made and before that happens the principal leads building base walks with their own teachers so they can give feedback about what's happening in their building so this is i think this is the wells road example from this year so the theory of action was when students clearly articulate what they're learning and why they will actively engage take ownership and set goals to achieve what they need to know and be able to do and so then the specific problem was are students able to articulate what they are learning and why they are learning it so this sounds very basic but one of the big things that we now know for sure in education is when kids can actually say what they're learning and why they're learning it then the chances of them making a, a long-term change in and what they know is huge. It's, it's a big, it's called effect size. One of the other challenging things, uh, because we often jump to conclusions without really sitting um, in the data of what we're seeing, is we try not to make too many inferences at the start. So over the course of the instructional rounds, we end up with really hundreds of pieces of data because all these groups come together, grab pieces, and we're sitting in this pool of data, and then slowly, we kind of make our inferences based on what we actually saw and what we heard. And at the end of the day, you have some time to do some analysis yourself, then you work with a group, and then you have to come up with some type of a framework that demonstrates what you saw. So along the bottom, those are giant pieces of chart paper that are shrunk down that show how different people have made hierarchies. You see a matrix. Sometimes it's a binary thing. And then all the groups make short and long-term recommendations to the principal and hopefully make a big difference in the practice that's happening. Questions on instructional rounds? Go for I it. I saw University of Michigan on the bottom of that pool yes. slide. Go back. <laughs> so this is just a citation. Um, Chris Argus, is, he's the primary researcher that uses this inference ladder. Um, there's lots of different versions of it, but his is the best visual image. Oh, yeah. I, I was thinking when I looked at that that sometimes the way that I approach things would be to climb from the ladder down. And I just thought that was kind of interesting. I reach my conclusion and then I figure out how you get there, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, when people often say go with your gut, that's a common thing that you hear. There's a lot of social science research behind that that says it's, you're actually not going with your gut. You're doing this thing in sociological research called thin slicing, and you're finding that thing that actually happens and all of the phenomena and experiences you have that actually inform that gut feeling. So what the ladder of inference is doing is trying to break that idea down. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Um, so when, when you're doing the instructional rounds, it, it, you may have said it in earlier slides, but how long, when you assemble your team, how long are you in the schools and um, is, it, is it a one day, all day thing or is it, are you looking at different slices and are you looking at it, um, so for Wells Road, are you looking at it um, multi-grades or just focusing on one grade at a time? Those are all great questions. Um, so the day itself, it's two-thirds of a day, um, I'll call it. And the way that we start the morning is we do an overview of what the process is. Because you always have new people, teachers, that have, may have never done the instructional rounds process before. So we have to calibrate them and explain what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So in order to do that, the technical side, the principal also sets the stage of, this is my school. This is what's been going on for the past however many years. This is some of the data, this is what we've experienced, and this is why I think this is a problem. And there's all this background to, to substantiate that. And ideally, people are able to collect what they see regarding that problem, and they can do the next steps. Very rarely, but it has happened before, we come back and they're like, um, that's not your problem. This is, the, this is a different problem. Mm -hmm. Other was questions, there, Mark? Or? Was there any takeaways from the Wells Road? Example? Yeah so, the, Pleasure. Pleasure. yeah, so there's all kinds of takeaways that happen, and I think you'll actually see some of them probably reflected in the school improvement plans tonight. Um, but with the short term, the framework is what is something that the principal can do at the next faculty meeting or in the next month to make a change to support this problem? And then the other, the long term, is what might they do this year to do that? Mark, did you have a question? Jenny? Do you have one? I, I think do. she's just going this way. So you oh. Um, move to the, move to the well, I was going to, 
I was going to ask about how the problems are identified. You said it comes from the principal. It, um, is it a tool that could be used for problems that are surfaced through other means? Yes, so the, the principal articulates the problem, but it's usually substantiated in something. So it might come from survey data, it might come from the teacher evaluation data from the year before. Um, I know uh, Kim Dessert, I think it was two years ago, she did survey the faculty, or, and based on, these are 23 instructional strategies that we know to be equity-focused instructional strategies. Which of these do we need to focus on? Where do we need to grow as a staff? so that she used their voices in helping articulate that problem. And that is always a helpful thing when you have as many voices as possible. Could, could it potentially come from the board via the community? I would say it depends on, on what it is. So the, the big piece with the instructional rounds process is it has to be related to something that's instructional and related to practice that you can observe. Okay. And so if it's big and global, uh, you have to kind of drill down to a more right. focused question that people can actually collect observable data to help. It's a tool fix. we could consider in the future. You could, uh, we don't want to. I don't want to perjure the tool mm -hmm. for different use. Okay, thank and you. And so another tool that's a, I'll call it a cousin of instructional rounds is what we used to call learning walks. That's when hey, we're wondering what the state of the state is on this topic. Um, and we kind of do that sometimes when you, we do board walks. So principals usually have a theme, mm -hmm. like the board has focused on this. When we do the walk with the walkthrough, can you make sure we see some math instruction or we see something with innovation? And that's that's kind of a nod at that. Okay, thank you. Um, Christa, and I apologize if you said this and I missed it. So the, every school does this at least once a year? So every school, the full instructional rounds happen in the fall. We have one more at Kelly Lane that's happening next week. And then we do another one in the spring, but it's a little bit smaller. So in the spring, we have secondary administrators and staff do the secondary schools, elementary do the elementary. So everyone's not out of their building for two full days. And so then there's they, they, building base. There's two mini ones that happen at the school level where the teachers are out watching other teachers practice. So there's in each school there's four total each year. Yeah, two big rounds district wide, and then there's two school based in the middle. And, and the the feedback is you, ultimately you get a report on how it worked and what the result was. So I'm there, so I facilitate it. So I get, I see what recommendations are happening, and. Every year, if we went back and looked at all of the school improvement plans from years past, we usually see an action step learning walks somewhere in there. Oh, I see. And this is just bringing that to life a little bit okay. with a new name, right. the yeah. artist formerly known as. <laughs> <laughs> is there any questions? No. Do the, um, at the, the coaches, do they play a role in this at all, at all since you're looking at instructional practice and whatnot? Often. I, I will say almost all of the time, the coaches are part of it, especially the coaches that are at that grade level. So the elementary coaches will always be at elementary rounds. All right, Chris, thank you. Well, we will expect to see you not until after the New Year. Yeah, we'll, we'll plan for 2020. <laughs> Thank you. Um, seeing no worries, I am going to go to the student representative reports. Um, Zach, welcome. Take it away. All right. So I normally cover athletics, and I'm staying with that. We're to well, and actually get uh, the, uh, what's going on around the school. So the field hockey team produced a total of $1,141 with their Play for the Cure funds. And Boosters Club for the high school said that homecoming weekend was a success. They raised over $3,500, and they're going to discuss tomorrow what they can use that money for at their meeting. Two boys cross-country runners made all conference this year, and that was Charlie Atnes, a freshman, and David Hitchner. Uh, the girls in soccer, yeah, the girls field hockey and soccer teams remained undefeated and are both at the top of their respective class entering the state tournaments. Uh, the field hockey and girls soccer both won the NCCC regular season. And then a girls soccer player, Tessa McMillan, won CT Varsity Athlete of the Week after scoring three goals in a win and then won against SMSA Windsor Locks and Summers that week. And now uh, Maria Nolan is up for Current Athlete of the Week for the girls soccer team. And then the boys soccer team finished in the top six for the fifth consecutive year. Um, so I have a question. I was 
Mark was talking about the cell phone policy at the high school. What do you think about the cell phone policy? Any, I mean, this is your chance to say how you feel about the cell phone policy and any changes you think might be needed, well, wanted. As an underclassman, I'd say it's more common that playing sports or just anything after school, you'll forget something, not having a car. And being able to like text your parent or something like when you remember it is helpful. I feel like it was more um, available last year when you could just pull out your phone really quickly and put it away. But um, I think most students are more focused now and the policy like is working. I don't think the students are like hiding their phones. I think teachers are like on top of it if they take them out. But I would say there are some teachers that are more lenient with the policy than others. Yeah, so for the record, the current policy is, uh, what's, what's the phrase? Bell no bell. cell to the bell? It's bell to bell, no cell, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're allowed to carry their phones and use them in passing time and in the um, lunch period and stuff like that, but they cannot use them during the instructional time. All right. So if you forget your place, you can still text between yeah. bells. Yeah, there is a time where you and can And in between you can characters. focus. Yeah, exactly. Or actually speak to each other between the bells. Yeah. <laughs> and for the record, there's some cheating going on in the policy, which is why they're discussing it. Uh, nice. uh, any other questions for Jack? All right, thanks, Jack. Uh, moving on to public comment, any member of the public who wishes to address the board, now's your chance. Please come up, tell us who you are, where you live, and what, what's on your mind. Seeing none. Moving on to the consent agenda. Can I have a motion? I'll move that the Grammy Board of Education adopt the consent agenda. I'll second. Discussion? Any additions, changes, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Abstain for the 16th. Jenny and Brandon abstain. Yeah, for the 16th. Old business, second reading of policy 6111, a policy that has created a lot of excitement from this board chair. Uh, yeah, so I've received no feedback. Um, I don't know, I don't believe, Chris, have you? No. This is the policy that allows us to set the graduation date oh, as, as a firm date, and this is a new law, and given the winter that we're talking about this is going to become especially exciting for parents of seniors um i know we have two senior parents on this board so it allows us to set it as a date firm which will be a huge i think we're we'll discuss it but um the thoughts are around a friday so that way friends and family can make travel plans to be in town without having to have that be a moving target and also have the ymca have a, a firm date for their safe grad right. so all right that one moves I have a quick question yeah. so uh, we're not just um, copying the correct language, are we? Or are we in this? Correct language, it's cave. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, all right. The, the only reason I said is because we considered um, at our last correct meeting a policy to implement state law, and it, um, it was presented to us as sort of standard language that everybody was using, and it was kind of screwed up. So we sent it back and had to look at it again. So if we're looking at the same language, just seemed like it, so. it, it was ambiguous and didn't really clear up the problem. But uh, so I think you just see us copy that. But if you guys are yeah, no, I think it, it focused on uh, it just giving giving the board the flexibility of the great. Is that what your correct language? I, I do not know yes. what your Yes, but there were some concerns raised, and I, I tell you what, never mind. I'll read it, and if Second, it's yeah, it's going forward it. to the third reading, so yeah. I'll read it if, it if it has this similar language to what we thought was troublesome. I'll let you know. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. All right. Moving along to new business, elementary school improvement plans. We have uh, Pauline Greer, the principal of Wells Road, and Kid Dessert, uh, principal of Kelly Lane School. I believe, Pauline, you are slated to go first. So welcome. <laughs> Pauline, how do you feel about the proposed winter and the snow days? <laughs> and Mark's edict. I think that's great. I've actually already been working on the weather, so that's why it was lovely last Friday when they went to Sturbridge. I brought the sun out. I said, you're welcome, friends. <laughs> um, so hi, uh, good evening. I am here to present my very first school improvement plan to Granby. I'm very excited in Wells Road. 
Um, when coming to Weld Road, obviously one of the things you do is just kind of take a look at what's happening. So it's been wonderful to kind of just see how so many things run. Um, but it's also really important to make sure that you establish some things. And the first thing that I truly believe in is relationships. And that's what uh, myself and the entire staff took a look at before we even began this year. So, um, so it was fun to kind of get to know one another. Um, I have, as you know, been on the other side of that wall as a parent. Um, um, not at Wells officially, but um, but certainly knowing that role. Um, so I'm going to figure out how to work this. There we go. And I'll get right to it. So that idea of making sure that we were building relationships um, as a team. We've been calling this like so many things in the district, Wells Road, we're 2.0, um, and establishing ourselves together. And so some of the things that I pulled out from the larger um, plan was really things that focused on that idea of how are we building relationships here. So um, the very first thing that I know the entire district at some point um, looked at um, using collaborative problem solving practices. And that mostly is just having conversations with kids when they're having a hard time. It, rather than this idea of always providing consequences, what's up, what's going on, Why are, wh what's happening that something's uncomfortable or your, tr your behavior is trying to communicate something. So that was already established in the building, but we wanted to enhance that procedure because it's a relatively new thing. So one of the things that's happening at this point is that we do meet, um, and those of you who know Wells Road, we have the six days, uh, six A, B, C, D, E, F, so six day cycle. And so within that six day cycle, we meet on B days. Um, we are working right now with third grade since they're new to our building and really talking with those teachers. They're bringing students up. Our core team is a social worker, our school psychologist, a couple of special education teachers. We also have a fifth grade teacher who was trained over the summer and is part of a district initiative. So she's, she's also part of that standing committee. And then teachers as they are available, especially our schedule's a little complex. So we wanted to make sure that we had it at a time where we could also have voices from other teachers. Um, and taking a look at kids during that time. Um, also kind of going along with that, one of the things that I noticed over the summer and kind of transitioning from Dr. Bailey was um, the amount of office referrals that happened, especially during that recess time, which I know sounds like, of course. But one of the problems really was that there was no dedicated lunch and recess um, TAs. Um, so it was TAs who are outside, but a lot of our TAs are one-on-one -on -one TAs. So although they might be outside, they were looking at a student or they were more focused on something like that. Um, and we didn't have enough supervision, I felt, outside. We have 165th graders, they're all outside at the same time. Um, that's seven sections. So with four, month, four, it was four TAs outside who mostly were one-on-one, -on -one, that's not enough people. Um, so this summer, um, Dr. Bailey actually left some money in the budget so we were able to hire three dedicated lunch and recess TAs. In addition to that, I also thought it was really important to make sure that we had certified staff outside. Um, so we do have a certified staff rotation, so teachers are outside one day a week for recess or one day in the six-day cycle um, for recess duty. Um, so that now we have kind of officially whatever number of sections we have is what's outside. So if there are five sections of third grade, there are at least five um, adults outside. Um, and oftentimes I'm one, so I add an additional adult outside during that time. Um, the third point up here in talking about building relationships, as you know, Dr. Mack is an amazing school psychologist and also our teacher of the year. Um, she sits down with every student at Wells Road, so 380 some odd kids, and she has what she calls her minute meetings. And she asks them, uh, think of, I want to say, six or seven questions, she asked it to every student. And one of the things that came out of that, um, her taking that data, was the fact that there were students in our building who couldn't um, identify a trusted adult. And that's third, fourth, and fifth graders. So obviously there were more third graders, but there were 17 students who could not do that, who didn't feel like they had a trusted adult in the building. Um, there were also, I took some data on this, nine students who felt like, I'm sorry, 
five students who felt like they had no friends in the building. And then we had some kids who fell into both of those categories, no trusted adult and no friends. And so we want to make sure that every student can name, especially a trusted adult and a friend in that building. There shouldn't be any child who comes through our doors that hasn't made a connection with someone. And so that's the work that we're going to be doing there. And then um, the last thing is, um, we talked as a staff at the beginning of the year about a school-wise policy. Um, last year they had tickets, and so if you have a fifth grader, um, Mrs. Roth, <laughs> they are not particularly happy that the tickets went away. <laughs> However, what we were finding was, <laughs> what we were finding is that the tickets weren't doing much of anything. Um, there was fights about the tickets, and conversations about the tickets, and all this kind of thing. So staff said, "Okay, we need something that's going to work better." So I said, "All right, let's take some time." continue building these relationships, but really think about something that's going to make sense for our entire building. So one of the things that we, um, so the leadership team and I have been talking and kind of taking a look at a, a variety of data. The thing that keeps floating to the top is we have some kind of handsy building sometimes. And so problems are being solved via hands pushing this, you cut in line, I got ice cream first, whatever is happening. And so we really want to take a harder look at that because not only for building relationships but for safety reasons. Um, so we're doing some data collection, seeing how many kids are kind of doing that. We're also making sure that we're watching. So we have um, a program that actually is also at Kelly Lane Second Step Curriculum, which is a social emotional program. And they talk about problem solving in that. And so um, that curriculum is being floated by all the teachers. And um, one of the things that's actually not on this sheet, um, but again, you might have heard about, is they used to stay outside in the morning until the bell rang at 8.30. Students now come directly into the building at 8.15 when the bell rings, buses come in, kids come in. That's provided for kind of a calmer start to us and also allows teachers to have eyes on kids immediately as opposed to them coming off the bus and going to the playground and getting riled up or if they're just having a bad day. And what we found is that um, that's also allowed some time in our schedule for us to make sure that we're implementing the curriculum with fidelity, where we really are having time for morning meetings with kids, sitting down, talking, talking about how to solve problems in those kinds of things. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, and I don't know if it's too soon to ask this mm -hmm. question, but you were to, one of the goals is to look at the number I'm assuming you reduce the number of office referrals Correct. based on the supervision and the playground. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to see any results, or is it too early? No, it absolutely isn't. Um, so yeah, one of the things when, again, looking at the data over the summer that was happening is that um, those key times, morning was one of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kids coming off of the bus, a little dysregulated, we're getting into arguments and things like that in the morning. So obviously, now they're walking in and I've had maybe two kids in the morning in the office since I've been there. And those have both were bus situations that kind of came into school where actually the kids were able to come in. So that's also helpful because they're walking right in the building, they're getting off the bus and coming into the office because they're already, you know, kind of in that argument. They also have we also have two adults right there to greet them. So they're like, why don't you head in there? Let's see if we can work it out before they even head to the class. So that's been really helpful for that, at least for the morning time. Yeah. Of course. Um, you said we had dedicated TAs for um, their outdoor activities. Correct. Does that mean what it sounds like? It means that that's all those TAs do is supervise the outdoor Correct. activities? Yes. So they only work a, a couple hours a day? Yes. Right, thank you. That was in that 2020 budget, too. I remember. Yeah, I remember. Um, our student achievement data. So the first one just kind of talks about our third graders. Again, they're just coming to us. They haven't done things like taking the Smarter Balance assessment yet. So we're looking at all their other measures, um, their benchmarks assessments for reading and the STAR assessment and things like that. We certainly want those to grow from second to third grade. The next goal, however, talks about fourth and fifth grade students who have taken the Smarter Balance. So one of the things that um, the school has always looked at is that idea of proficiency. You know, are kids making benchmark? Are they making their goals? But I also wanted to make sure that we're looking at how students are growing. 
So I took a look at our um, growth target data. So it kind of works that the state gives them kind of, you should be growing this amount of points within a school year. Um, some kids hit that target, some kids don't hit that target. For the kids who don't hit that target, we want to take a look and see how much of that target they have hit. So even though they should be hitting that 100%, they might have hit 80% of it. They might have hit 60% of it. They might not have hit any percent of it. But we want to take a look at that and be able to kind of celebrate when kids really have made significant growth, even though they haven't hit maybe that 100%. If they're at a 90% target, we should be watching that, but also celebrating that. And if they're not making any of that target or going backwards for whatever reason, we also want to make sure that we're paying attention to that. This number from 77% to 80%, I will tell you, is a rough number. It is not a perfect number, but this is the first time that the buildings actually looked at this growth target data. So I want us to be able to kind of play around with it a little bit more rather than talk about every student making this much growth because that's kind of hard to take a look at all together. So this at least puts our eyes on it and kind of thinks about how we are watching kids grow and not just whether they're hitting benchmark or not. Um, that also provides, I think, some support for students who are really working very hard and moving along, even if you're, if you're you know, so far behind, if you're a one on Smarter Balance and you've made all of this growth, but you're still not at benchmark, we should know that and we should be able to celebrate that and also think about where those students are headed next. Um, so that measurement um, is kind of new for staff as we take a look at it. Um, a very public thank you to uh, Katie Busby, as well as the coaches, Kristen Rice and Amy Lapoli um, and Lane Rea, because they really helped me kind of disaggregate some of this information. Um, having said that, um, we are certainly making sure that we are tracking students um, in the dip throughout the different tiers. So again, as kind of our rotation and making sure we're setting up with, we are making sure that we are having our what we call student intervention team meetings. Um, SRBI basically, um, and we're doing that on a rotating uh, schedule. Uh, I, it's not a letter day. This one's a Monday, mm -hmm. officially. <laughs> we have one meeting on Mondays and then the other meeting shifts a little bit on Thursdays um, because we have students who are already intervention that we're watching right now and students who are new to the intervention process. At some point, hopefully, that will all be one schedule, but right now it's kind of a separate schedule to make sure that we aren't missing anybody. Um, in addition to that, um, one of the the next two kind of go, especially the middle one, kind of goes along with what um, Chris was talking about from our instructional rounds. So we were really excited when we were descended upon by the entire uh, administrative team of the district and teachers and took a look around Wells Road, what was going on. And one of the things that we were able to see is that there were many students who actually knew what they were supposed to be learning and could articulate it, which was awesome. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that they had ownership in what they were doing. So being able to make their checklist, being able to kind of use what was given to them and co-creating those ideas. And we found that there were some pockets of that already happening, and that's the thing that we want to grow. When kids are more connected when they are creating their work, when they are invested in what they're doing, that's when we see kind of that bang for the buck and that's when we see more progress from them. So that's one of the things that came out of our rounds and that's what we will continue to um, look at as the year continues. The last thing on this slide um, talks a little bit about um, increasing that those math strategies progression. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the math program Eureka. It has a lot of parts to it and it's very comprehensive. Oftentimes, however, as they, I think especially because we're an intermediate school, kids are going right to that abstract section rather than kind of slowing down a little bit because they feel like they're big people. So in slowing down a little bit and making sure that they're doing that concrete and then moving along to the uh, representational, pictorial, and then finally just to the numbers. So that becomes also really important. We want to make sure that kids are using those kind of strategies to slow themselves down and to think more deeply about the math at hand. 
Pauline, just a quick question for you. Um, last, at our last board meeting, we had a presentation by Chris of um, our scores mm -hmm. and uh, an area of concern for the board is math. Yeah. Um, we asked Chris, we put him on the spot, and we said uh, two, two things that you might recommend mm -hmm. um, to help. And one of his recommendations, it was a math interventionist at Wells Road. Yes. Um, understanding that the budget discussions are underway and that we want to support our schools. Um, do you presently have any math support at Wells Road? Are we talking about an additional interventionist? Is there someone who's playing a dual role right now? So right now, um, the only people, so there were some students who require math intervention. That's coming right now out of our special education department, which is just so difficult um, because they have their own caseload and they have pretty large caseloads. So any intervention that is done is done through them. Okay outside of the classroom. So the other piece of that is making sure that we have strong tier one intervention, meaning that teachers have a focus goal and they're working with students in small group, but and that's where this really becomes important because oftentimes because teachers, you know, you have students who are working well above and well below, um, making sure that they have the materials out and that they know how to use those concrete materials, that they know that students need that progression before they can just work in with the numbers. So our coaches are doing a really wonderful job of going in and talking about that instruction for First, making sure that teachers are demoing with the actual concrete before they move right into those abstract numbers for students. But yet, to answer your question is, we do need a math intervention. Okay. Any other questions? So, since we're asking about math, and I apologize if this was discussed at the last meeting, but and I am not a curriculum um, geek at all, but I hear comments about Eureka Math. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, 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 I was going to say, what's, uh, what, what is our point of view? I'm going to ask you, what is your point of view on our commitment to Eureka Math? It sounds like you're talking about ways of implementing it and using it that would make it more effective because, because we're not, because sometimes we let them go too far, or, or is our commitment to it wrongly based? Um, so I truthfully, this is my first, um, work with Eureka Math, for me, I think what's most important is that teachers understand those math standards, right? Um, Eureka is a program. It's never going to be perfect. No program ever right. is. Right. So the more our teachers understand the standards, the better any sort of supplement will be to that. And that's really been my focus. It's like, as opposed to allowing the program to lead you, right. we need us to think about that standard, how we're going to teach it. And that may be using the Eureka Math workbook page as an exit ticket yes. to see what they know. It might be as an entrance ticket. Maybe they worked with it the day before, and so you're going to see what they're starting off with. But it might not always be just the program itself. These kind of programs come with a variety of different parts and pieces to them. Um, and then it's up to the teacher to figure out really what's going to work for their class at their moment and so knowing the standards and understanding really what they're supposed to be teaching is just really the most important part of any sort of curriculum okay I really like that answer <laughs> can I ask Chris that question too I mean is that the right yeah, the absolutely. right way to be viewing our commitment to Eureka maths yes, definitely and okay. so we go into curriculum revision starting really the end of June um, for our big math overhaul. And so the focus is really taking the standards first approach. Um, the challenge that we faced and why we are where we are and my, uh, I won't say my best guess, but based on the data and the performance, is we merged um, pedagogy that was misaligned with the instructional resource that we chose. So we were trying to make our old teaching style work with new resources for the sake of trying to mitigate how massive the change was and as a result we ended up where we are and so we overcorrected by saying stop doing what you were doing you're going to just do Eureka and that's kind of where we were the past two years and now it's like okay now that we got rid of this old practice where are we with the standards and we're going to move forward using the Eureka to support the standards and I think Pauline did a nice job just by showing the concrete first because it's the dissonance between concrete and abstract thinking um, that causes confusion for lots of people yeah. um, and 
Well, then it becomes an excuse. It's, it's, I, I started, it's, it's like we have this codependent relationship with this thing called Eureka. It becomes our excuse for not succeeding, and, and that doesn't sound and right. And I would say that's the universal language of whatever pro, whatever the program is. That's it would, whatever it was, we district. would have the same. Okay. And you point, there aren't too many philosophies on mathematics instruction, different, different pedagogies. They kind of stem from two big ones, and all of the ones that schools are using really mostly inspired from Singapore math. There aren't too many mm -hmm. variants right now, and Eureka is one of them. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't think that the, the problem is Eureka. There's, okay. there's other things we can look at related to the instructional core. Okay, great, thank you. And what year is this for us with implementation of Eureka? Is it four? I have a very complicated Oh, chart. because of how it's all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that chart, yeah. 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 <laughs> Depends on the grade. Coded. Depends on the grade. Yeah. Okay. Are we in any way committed, like long term, to Eureka? Or we could change anytime we want, right? But we could always change what we want. But my push at the last the meeting program. was we've, we've invested a lot of money because mm -hmm. Eureka has a lot of consumables that go with it. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is one thing we know for sure in educational research is we experience implementation dips when we make major changes mm -hmm. to curriculum. Of course. And the grade that has been at it the longest. Um, which were our current seventh graders have had an increase in math performance every year. So those are my two, the two things I would point to. Yeah, we had a super robust discussion about this at the, okay. the last board meeting. It was probably went on for about 40 minutes. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> no, was, there were some good questions. The and, the and, the and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like your answer. Great. Yeah. The minutes are great about this. Thoughts and awesome recommendations. Standards first. Standards first. Exactly. Tools. Tools applied. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Oh, can before you move on, yeah. um, the what about the the kids at the top of the class? Mm -hmm. um, they often are not as. Um, tracked as closely, but if you've got a kid who's already meeting goal, are you tracking them to make sure they are making a full year's worth of progress, even if that puts them well beyond the next year's, um, the next year's standards? The answer to that is yes. Um, I'm going to shout out Katie Busby again, who's our enrichment coach, um, who does a variety of things, including um, working with our students, working at exactly what you're talking about, that higher end. Um, I also thought that the goal that I have for fourth and fifth grade students was also important, again, because they all have a target of growth. So it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum. Um, the state kind of gives you kind of a percentage point of numbers that you should be meeting. So that's a way for us to make sure that we're not just targeting one group for proficiency, because that does what that's what ends up happening for those higher kids. Is that okay? Great, you're a four, you're a blue collar, whatever it is, and then we don't have to worry about you because you're already at that benchmark. But they still should be making growth. Having said that. Um, there's a, a couple of things that happen at Wells. One is um, enrichment, simply enrichment, um, that Mrs. Busby works with students. There are also a group of students who really are working at that next level. And so um, I, I don't want to speak for on behalf of her, but there is um, a compacting of curriculum that students are able to work through if they are at the level that you're talking about. And is that 80%, if they, they hit that eight, average of 80% growth, is that a full year? Um, it depends. It's, of course, it's not as easy, right? The, the state has specific targets at specific areas. I have a chart if you'd like to see it sometime. But they talk about how many, um, what the band is for the number of points when, within each one of those. So yes, in that configuration of just moving everybody forward would have an impact on those students as well. So the band is much more narrow yeah. for those students that are at a four. So they have still have a target. Um, and the great thing about this goal is this is a way to have the goal that actually accounts for all of the students um, using the same measure. So that's great. But for you would think that students that have a four, oh, they're going to hit their target no matter what. That's actually not our experience. Mm -hmm. um, and even though that band is narrow, we're still not we're still not getting there. So for example, that the, that range of targets, if you're at the low end of the low band, you could have numbers up to 80, 82. If you're at the higher end, but at the, so in the band four, so the exceeding, um, but you're at the lower end of that band, your numbers might be 60, 49, 30, so that, that, that narrowing happens that Chris is talking about, but it's still the expected growth for those students. 
And you're talking about growth across subject areas, not right. just so math. Right, so there's a number for ELA, ELA and then there's a number for math. That's why I said I have charts here if you want to see them, but okay. it's, then, much, it's not as clean as, oh, you know, 10% across right. the board or anything like that. How is, sci how is progress in science measured, or is that not something that's really? That I don't have up here. Okay. Um, science being fairly new to us, I, I, I haven't delved deep enough in those science, just those science numbers yet to kind of have okay. any answer for that one. So instruction, um, we talked about learning marks and we talked about that idea of enhanced engagement and independence for our students. So um, talking about students having learning goals, especially as a workshop school where readers and writers, where students are given choice, um, it's important for those students to know where they are. Um, one of the things that happens on, in our instructional rounds is oftentimes a teacher might be teaching a mini lesson. Um, that mini lesson may or may not apply immediately to the students around in writing, for example. Students in third grade might be working on, you know, in a variety of ways. Um, the teacher just gave a mini lesson on paragraph. Well, there are some students who are ready for paragraphs and some students who are still working on their sentences. So when you go around, their goals might be simply to have four sentences on the page because that's where they are, but there are students who would also be working on paragraphs. So that personalizing of those goals and for students to know what they should be working on and when is important. During our rounds time, we saw an example of all the students as they were working had these separate goals, but they also knew that they needed at least four sentences or at least so much writing. So it's teachers finding personal goals but also holding students accountable and having students be part of that those conversations. Um, the second point talks about um, students, uh, providing students with specific and actionable feedback. Um, again, including that repertoire so they might say, um, from an exit ticket, they might find that a student needs X, Y, or Z. Students being able to understand what it is that they're working on and how the teacher came to that and having conversations based on that work in front of them. Um, the third point on here talks about making sure that we find authentic audience and purpose to increase engagement and stamina. When students have purpose, they do better. Um, that idea that um, making connections, especially for kids when they're not sure what to do. So when you put things in context, I've seen more and more um, in classrooms speaking about math when they're talking about decimals, go to money, because money makes connections for kids and then they can kind of hang on to what's happening. So we have pretend stores and all these kinds of things where students are engaged in that learning. They have something authentic for them. Um, I had a lovely letter from a student who um, was not particularly happy happy about me getting rid of morning recess. Um, so I got a lovely letter that explained exactly why we needed morning recess back and was set up beautifully, including with paragraphs and started with Dear Ms. Greer. But when we give students purpose, it's a, they will use it and then produce more and more. Actually, his mother was like, I can't even believe he wrote this to you. <laughs> it was a full page, too. It was beautifully done. Um, but those kinds of ex um, experiences for students put them more engaged. That's when you get the better work from them. And then the last one, again, talks about that idea of anchoring math instruction with a standards focus. So not just relying on the next page of the program and turning the page because the book says that this is the next page, but really thinking about how we're going to utilize our resource and how we're going to make sure that it's grounded in standard. What's the educator group so that had to get used to all these things it connects to yeah that, that connects back to the teacher evaluation so 1.3 is making sure that um, that in planning that our objectives are very specifically aligned to what's happening I just wanted to um, there's quite a bit of material still to cover in the presentation oh, so maybe we should hold our questions to the end in case they're answered for us Oh, no, that's not actually. Oh, the next yeah. one is oh. Kelly. I yeah. was like, is I there? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'll keep talking, but I don't think so. <laughs> I'll take questions. <laughs> oh, we have something in our packet. You have the full. Got it. Got so have, this is the right. summary. This Got is it. the summary. Right. All right. Have yeah. at it, board. <laughs> The, uh, uh, this may be an unfair question um, at this 
state of your tenure, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The, uh, when we talk about enhancing instruction, uh, in this case to Im include authentic audience, but in, in any event, um, do you have a sense of how much of that is um, other tools and resources versus um, uh, professional development of the teachers? I don't think it requires additional tools and resources. I do think it is, um, again, shout out to our coaches um, who are doing that kind of work in classrooms and showing teachers how to make those connections. Um, we also have, you know, wonderful collaborative time throughout the day that I'm actually going in there. I talk a lot about that. My background is curriculum, so it is kind of my love. Um, and how we can make sure that, again, students are connected to their learning. It is so imperative at this point because otherwise things just become extraneous. And that's when you get the, oh, I don't remember that. I don't know that. They don't understand it in different contexts because it, it hasn't kind of sunk in deeply yet. So it's really much more about professional development, which can happen in a variety of ways, including our collaborative time and um, when teachers do coaching cycles. Are you finding our um, people receptive? Very. Yes, Perfect. absolutely. Okay. Very receptive. Thank you. And really excited. Okay, good. Because I am. <laughs> Any other questions for the board for Pauline? So your first couple months, things are good? We're doing all right. All right <laughs> they keep having me back, so that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kim? It's always great to be here, and um, I'm hoping you're going to see some connections between not just Wells Road, but also with the middle school and high school, because one thing that we have realized this year is that we're all kind of focusing on some of the same things, really looking at student ownership and really making sure that our teachers understand the standards so that they're able to turn around and help the students and instruct the students versus with the standards. So I'm hoping that you're going to see some of the connections here. Um, and it's always great to talk about and brag about the school and the great work that the teachers are doing at our school. Um, so kind of really very much tied and aligned with um, Pauline. I'm really fortunate to have her as a colleague. We're doing a lot of learning together um, and a lot of collaborating together. So it's great to have her here as a colleague. Um, the first goal is really about creating those conditions to support that safe, supportive, and collaborative culture. Um, we just spent Tuesday, yesterday, kind of doing um, a PLC 2.0 um, with the whole district and also with um, on Monday, some administrators, we did some work with Amy Tepper, some of our own professional development. And it's really about creating that learning culture. And that's really important that we do that in all of our schools and with our whole district. Um, that first action step really talks about that collaborative and proactive problem solving that we've been doing. We started last year a little bit. And really, again, it all stems from relationships and having those conversations with students and talking with them and finding out where they're at. It all stems from relationships and really the philosophy behind this is that and you've heard Amy Martin speak of it often is that students do well if they can but we really need to look at their social and emotional learning just as much as their academic learning we need to teach those lagging skills and support them and make sure that they're getting those skill those uh, um, learnings addressed also just as much as their academic so that's really important um, the other big piece here, and we always, I talk always about the absenteeism, that chronic absenteeism when you are a pre-K to two school, that's how the state rates us. Um, we're really looking at this, our absenteeism, we're looking at our data a little bit differently. Instead of just looking at the number of 5% and trying to get 5% or below, it's really understanding that every piece of data, there's a name and a face behind that data. So who are those children? So instead of just trying to get below that target number, it's more about looking at each child and saying, where were you last year and where are you this year? And is are your days decreasing? So for instance, from the 2018 data, seven of the students that were chronically absent um, in 2018, they were not chronically absent in 2019. So to us, that's an improvement. We're working with individual families 
working with students to making sure that they are here at school so that we're able to teach them. So that's really important for us. Um, so that's the absenteeism piece of it. But we also do know that when we go through that, the social worker, the nurse, and I, we sit down and look at all of our absenteeism data. And some of it is due to medical. So we really have to look at each child as an individual in each case there. Um, and then the other big piece when we're looking at that collaborative culture, um, teachers are, at Kelly Lane, we are doing something called I-teams. So they are selecting an inquiry project and personalizing their own professional development. So once a month they have created their own kind of problem of practice and something they want to learn about and be become more passionate about and find out how they can help the students in their classroom. And they work together as a team. They um, people put up like topics and we just kind of like an unconference that we do. So they pick topics as to what they want to learn about, what's going to help them there. So they have some choice in their professional learning at that piece of it. Some of the examples this year and every year they change based on what the teachers need. So this year a couple teachers are working on creating a mathematical minded community, um, supporting students that challenge us, looking really at mindfulness and really looking at that social and emotional learning, which is, as we know, is very key, especially at the early ages of students. Sorry. Um, Did you want to share? I'm, I'm just, I, sure. I'm always trying to triangulate back to uh, specific budget resources that we have yeah. made available. And, um, I, and I don't, it, it seems to me that there was a resource that probably, w that would have been involved in um, interacting with kids and families on the chronic absenteeism. Yes. Is, is there a tie-in there yes, that we should know absolutely. about? We, we need to know if sure. there are tie-ins or that. not with some of the yeah, expenses. Yeah, absolutely. Some that's of the our social worker. So last year was her first year with okay. us. So, that's, so this is now her second year with us and really working on a lot of the social and emotional pieces, working on that absenteeism piece of it, um, and putting in um, interventions and so strategies. So you would say the seven that, that went from bad to not bad right. is directly tied Absolutely. to that investment? Yes. Okay. Very much so. <laughs> Thank you. So very similar to what Colleen talked about, we really want to make sure that we're looking at increasing our students from academic progress and really looking at growth and how students are making that growth. Um, so one of our big pieces here is that we want to make sure that teachers are using timely data and identify students for targeted interventions or even extending that learning. And that's where we're really looking at refining our SRBI process. The district did a lot of work on that towards the end of last year and during the summer. And we really are implementing that at our school and really making sure that we're answering those last two questions of the PLC. What are we going to do if our students are not learning it? But also, okay, what about those students that have already learned it? How are we going to increase their learning and making sure that their that progress is happening so that is happening during our um, SRBI process the other piece is it's really looking at um, our achievement gap data and some of the recommendations from the equity um, team and those recommendations and really spending time again with monitoring the achievement of our underperforming subgroups and in implementing those student action plans as needed that also Jenny is a piece where my social worker, part of her role is also is um, our choice liaison. And that's part of the things that she's doing too, to monitor with the teachers the progress of those students. And if there is a student that we are not having those same rigorous goals for, that working with the teacher and creating those goals and making sure that we can try to close that achievement gap right from the very beginning. So that's another piece that she's done. And that also addresses some of the um, equity team recommendations that were out there. Um, the other piece, again, it's again about using our coaches and really focusing and strengthening our tier one classroom instruction, and that comes through our coaches. And having them, we spent a lot of time last year doing some learning with Diane Sweeney on student-centered coaching, and really focusing on how can the classroom teacher at that tier one instruction, how can that change, how can that become better to be able to support students in the classroom with their achievement. So can I ask yeah. a question before sure. we move off the slide? Um, under resources, finances, three of the four bullets that you have here is time. Yeah. Um, Let me just go to my full version. Sure. Are you saying you need more time? 
We just need to make sure that we have that allocated time within our day and within the week to be able to do that. So when we talk about teachers using timely data, they need to have time to meet with the interventionist because if students are going out for tier two or tier three instruction, we need to make sure that they're also having time with the classroom teacher to calibrate and um, make sure that they're teaching the same strategy to the student instead of doing one thing in the classroom and one thing out of the classroom. That's just gonna confuse the student even more. So we wanna make sure that we're doing the same thing so the child's getting more time and this more practice with that strategy. And so uh, have you found the dedicated time during the day? We have the dedicated time um, for some of our interventions happening, for all of our interventions happening, and some of our SRBI time. Teachers could always use more time, and it's just very challenging to be able to make that happen within the day. So. They're being very creative with their schedules. And because we, we have such dedicated teachers here, some of it's going beyond the school day. And then our instructional goal is really about students taking ownership for their learning to foster an environment of independence and engagement. This is the, those pieces that I think you've talked about at subcommittee about um, students and having, I mean, teachers having clarity and making sure they're explaining what we want students to know and be able to do, why it's important. And then the next piece is making sure that students know how, when did I get there? When did I make that successful piece of it? And having that success criteria. So for instance, I just happened to be in a room the other day and the learning target was I can count money. And then the teacher and I talked about that because the unit that they were in right now for math is really a place value unit. So we talked about how we can just tweak that just a little bit so that kids really understand the why, that they're a mini place value unit, but I'm tuning money, where did that come from? So we talked about it and decided that if we could to have kids have more clarity on the standards and what's there is that I can use place value to count money so that they're having those connections and understanding what's really happening there in that classroom. And a lot of that, again, it all falls back to those standards, making sure that they are aligned, but they're also clear, that teachers know exactly what does the standard mean and how can I be really clear when I'm explaining it to the child and the student there. Um, and the really next piece, again, it's that making sure that we're sharing that success criteria through exemplars, teacher modeling, and rubrics so that students know when they have met that learning target and when they have met their goals. Um, and then the last piece is we're really very excited about this. A couple teachers have tried last year doing some student-led conferences. So our goal with the leadership team is to be able to provide some professional learning for staff. So therefore, we're having um, student-led conferences at our March conference time. Um, a couple teachers, like I said, they did it last year, and we had very positive feedback from the parents and the students. And these were first grade classrooms that were doing it. And it really allows students to take ownership for their learning. And that's that whole piece that we want all of our students to, to be able to do. Um, so that's our biggest goal for the year, is really to have some of the student-led conferences. Question. So because of the age of the primary school students, yeah. Pre-K through two, there's no there's no S back in your school. No. Outside of absenteeism, how do you measure success? We measure success by using some of our benchmark assessments that we have for the district. For example, our BASS assessment. Um, we use STAR to look at that. Also, we use our writing rubrics, and we use in all of our curriculum we have performance assessments and performance tasks. So that's how it's all measured. Questions? Other questions for the board? I was just curious. I noticed a couple in a couple different um, sections that you referenced Seesaw. Can you just talk yeah. a little bit about what that is and what that includes and is it school wide? Sure. So Seesaw this year, we are using it school wide. Um, it is a, an app that families can use and teachers use, and it's a great way to connect families to school and to the learning that's happening there. Um, as we know, not everybody can be in the classroom all the time or see what's happening there, but through Seesaw, kids are able to take a picture of the work that they're doing 
and it goes directly to the parents. And then parents can see that and see the learning that's happening in the classroom. So this year, all teachers are using it. Um, it's just a great way, again, for kids also to show their learning. Um, we're hopefully, our goal is to use that as a portfolio for the year to show student growth. Um, and then we have the purchased version of Seesaw, so it can continue for next year also. So you can see where a child started reading in first grade, and then where are they in the middle of first grade reading, and then where are they at the end of first grade reading. So you can really track their progress and their learning. So as a parent, I'm only seeing my child's absolutely. work. It's not one of the platforms no, that no, I'm no. seeing the entire class. No, absolutely not. You get your own child's there. Cool. Yeah. There's like group pictures. I, yeah, I, I thought, I, because my I, I had a student, and I think they were using it, um, not universally, but at, at Wells Road, and um, there were, there was a, a, you could see other students, and you could see, um, and I had mixed feelings, honestly, about yeah. the use of it because I think there was an, it, it was almost like Facebook for kids. You could, um, parents could like a picture or yeah. parents were asked to, you know, for homework, respond to something on the seesaw. Yeah. And um, so I, I just, yeah. maybe so more supervision around how that's used. Yeah. Absolutely. So Amber, our media person, our media tech person, she really works very closely with teachers on that. Um, and there are certain settings you can set them at. She can take the likes off, and it's really just for the parent to have that like. It doesn't go out to everybody who has that like. Um, there's certain things that if you wanted to share things with the whole class, you can share things with the whole class. If you want it just with the student, it's just for the student. And for privacy matters, any of the student work goes just to the parents. Brandon, did you... Did you share? Because I know you're, some of your children. I, I have it. I, I, I like it, to be honest with you. I mean, you get, like, for the Halloween, so you get yeah. the class Halloween picture, and you can see it, and, you know, parents yeah. can like it and things yeah. like that. And you see what your son does or your daughter does. And um, I just had a question about, sure. um, you said the keep, keeping, like, a portfolio. Yeah. Is there other things kept within Seesaw that we don't necessarily get pushed to us? Put to, um, you would have to check with the teacher because she can, depending on what the teacher has for it, but it's just a great way to have their student work in there. Okay. Yeah. I tend to like it just to... It's just, you know what, you're not able to see what goes on during the day. every now and then. Yeah. So every now and then you just get a picture out when you're at work, you can look at your phone and see what's happening in your child's, in his classroom, in his day, and it's just a great way to connect and engage families. Because it is hard. Many of us are all working and you're not able to come into the classroom as much as you like to, so... It just keeps that connection happening. Any other questions for the board? Jack, any of the sound like the old memories are coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we had all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Things have changed even, even in your time. Feeling, even you're feeling old? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. Seesaw right, was in your Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, moving on to miscellaneous board standing committee reports. Curriculum, policy, technology, communication. So we did meet tonight, um, and a couple of things. We, um, we reviewed the assistant superintendent's monthly report, um, just some highlights um, in the district. Um, Chris is working with the committee um, to uh, examine the pathways with the electives that we're offering in the high school and um, to to kind of more clearly define those and leverage those opportunities um, within the STEM fields. <coughs> so I think we're going to hear more of that um, down the road. Um, and then we also talked about uh, the November, um, just a little bit about the November PD, um, October PD um, was focused on, on self-care and wellness. We reviewed that previously. And um, I think that was about it for the, the highlights for the Assistant Superintendent's Monthly Report. We also reviewed a revised policy 4212-.42, uh, which is um, entitled Drug and Alcohol Testing for School Bus Drivers. Um, it, um, we changed some uh, language because we use a contractor to more um, push the liability onto the sub the contract the subcontractor. Um, so that language changed. 
um, and there's some additional training that school bus drivers get for administration of EpiPens and for allergic reactions. So um, there were some recommendations um, to uh, possibly amend the either change the number of the policy or look at a different title because um, just the title of drug and alcohol testing for school bus drivers doesn't encompass fully what the policy um, was designed to address. Um, but that was moved to the full board with those amendments. Sarah and I are going to be reviewing a couple of new texts um, she, Sarah's doing the French text, and I'm looking at a, um, a um, online uh, vocabulary program. Um, so I'm going to get a link to that. We did mention in subcommittee it's that since Sarah is from Northern Maine, it is only fair that all the French texts are That's reviewed right. by Sarah. That's right. We do the French one. Do you know French, Sarah? <laughs> a little bit. A <laughs> petit <laughs> um, We talked a little bit about uh, school counseling planning and just um, looking at our next um, curriculum subcommittee. Uh, and I think moving forward, we're just going to have a document review of what the guidance curriculum looks like and um, asking the questions of um, if if there's stuff about the curriculum that needs to be enhanced, if it's being um, uh, implemented with fidelity, those types of things, and if there's any deficiencies, um, looking to the administration to develop a process to address that. And that was about it. Our next, we did move our next subcommittee meeting um, because of other uh, obligations in the district. That's going to be December 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, yep, just a comment or, uh, on the counseling um, mm -hmm. that you're going to look at. The um, I've always uh, my, my understanding of the career counseling position that we have is it, it's sort of got added in, but it's technically a TA level position. Right. It's not. It's been hugely successful, well loved. Um, I would be surprised that we aren't. That, that it's well I don't know but it could well be proposed to us that this become a um, uh, be elevated to a full-time position in the next budget I don't know that for sure but in any event it, it's not really tied organizationally to counseling and yet one of the issues that has come up from time to time in discussing counseling is the connections on the college and college support to, right. to parents so I would just mention that as something to make sure you make that connection if you're going to be looking at Absolutely. it because i'm not sure it's organizationally connected yeah. and it should be that's exactly what we talked about oh right okay. exactly <laughs> yep there we go you're thank you. yep so thank you i think we're all on the same page all right any other questions for rosemary yeah. finance personnel and facilities and i still say you guys need a longer name <laughs> Did we use have technology in there too or something? Yeah, we should. Sure. Oh no, we have technology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want to back. Yeah. Oh, um, we haven't met since your last meeting. Um, other board-related reports. I know Mark, you mentioned CREC meeting. Um, we you mentioned the policy, so I didn't know if you've met. Right, that was the last meeting. Um, so no, we have not met since I last reported. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cabe. Granby Education Foundation. Uh, the, at the last meeting, I just did want to mention publicly, several people have rolled off the board. And I apologize if I missed somebody, but I did want to acknowledge Karen McNay, Janice Stingel, and Kathy Ungerleiter. And we welcome three new members, Ann Prokoff, Marcy Green, and John O'Connor. Um, uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention to this board was that they are looking at some new fundraising events not that we don't love the bee and expect everybody to be involved in the bee. Um, and one uh, that is being worked on it would be a strings event, uh, bringing in um, uh, somebody, but that potentially including some of our youngest uh, strings professionals um, before, during, or after as, as part of the event, um, which I thought was a really cool idea. So I just wanted to mention that and more to come on some of these new events. Great, thank you. 
calendar of events. Everyone can read um, what's upcoming. I don't think anything. We don't, do we have any dances, Jack, at the high school coming up, or no, any revelry of any kind that we should know about? <laughs> Or that we shouldn't know Oh, James the Giant. Yeah, that's this weekend. James uh, Roll Doll. Yeah, that's right? Sunday, I believe. And then um, Coffee House is coming up in oh. early December, I want to okay. say. So not that right. soon, but. Yeah. All right, just to keep us. I think it's November 23rd. November 23rd. It's the Coffee House? Yep. All right. I know you're double double duty tonight. I know that you're normally, this might be in Doritha's wheelhouse, so I appreciate the. Uh, I think Dorita said last meeting that it got changed to the 20. It got changed one day. I don't know if that was changed this meeting, but last meeting it was incorrect. On the Linda, if you could just do an email blast, because I know a lot of the board members love the Coffee House. It's a great event um, with the actual date, so I make sure we're. It is the 20th. Okay, thank you. Do we know what time? 730. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, action items. I didn't have any. Seeing no need for an executive session or non meeting, do we have a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, everyone have a good night. Thank you.